Hello, and welcome to the forum. Every week, we take no more than 15 minutes to discuss the three highest conviction ideas surfaced across the Smart Karma network, cutting through the noise and helping you zero in on what truly matters most. The live forum and Q&A session are exclusively available to Smart Karma Plus subscribers. You can always revisit previous episodes on this YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into this week's ideas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the weekly Smart Karma Forum. As a reminder, the forum is a high impact weekly live webinar, which is exclusive for Smart Karma Plus subscribers. We use the forum to discuss and present some of the best, highest conviction ideas and insights surfaced across the Smart Karma network. Our disclaimer, the forum is meant purely for informational purposes and does not constitute investment advice. It is the opinion not of Smart Karma, but that of our insight providers. And lastly, Chatham House Rule applies. Every week, we use the forum to discuss three ideas, typically a small gap, a large gap, and a thematic, and we mix it around. Um, and these ideas are surfaced using the data on the platform, what is really driving a lot of engagement and interest. And many times, these are very, very differentiated ideas where research probably only exists on Smart Karma and nowhere else. Since the start of this year, we have started to put recordings of the weekly forum on YouTube, so that in case you've missed the forum uh, and want to view it at your own time and pace, you can do that through our YouTube channel. Um, you can also use these videos to share them with your friends and discuss ideas. Last week, we discussed Keepers Holding. It's uh, one of our favorite multi-baggers in Philippines. It is the dominant monopoly for spirits um, in the country. You can think of it as the Diageo of Philippines and it's trading on about eight to nine, nine times PE. Next, we took a look at Grab's recent results. Grab is a name that we have not favored on the platform going into the IPO and afterwards but it's starting to look interesting. And so we took a closer look at what the results presented and what the outlook might be. And last, we, we spent important time discussing stagflation. Stagflation is probably the macro environment for us for the coming few months. Uh, it's a time when growth will slow down and inflation will ratchet higher and central banks will be in a real conundrum to raise rates or not to focus on growth or to focus on inflation, causing a lot of uncertainty and volatility in markets. What do we have in store today? So first, we're gonna kick off by studying the recently concluded demerger at Olam. This is a Singapore listed agri company. Then we will take a look at, um, you know, an important macro question that we've all been asking for the last two weeks, which is what the Ukraine crisis really means for Asia. Uh, and, and sort of how will the reaction of companies and governments in Asia change as an aftermath? And lastly, we will take a look at a sector, which is the cybersecurity sector. And it's a sector where we are very favorably dis uh, disposed whether there's a war or no war. So let's kick things off. Um, before I do, just a reminder that you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A button on your Zoom application. The forum will be fairly rapid fire, very short. We'll probably finish the presentation in about eight to 10 minutes. Olam. So Olam is uh, well covered on the platform. Um, we've been largely quite bullish, quite positive on the stock uh, for the last year. Um, this is a stock that's been covered by Nick Van Brockhoven, by David Blenner Hassett, and also by Aaron George. And you can always see that very quickly on the platform. If you go to a company like Olam here, you can see which analysts have covered that stock here in the related analyst section. You'll also notice that the investor relations team of Olam is also on Smart Karma. So you can actually contact them straight from the platform if you have questions. Okay, so let's take a look at the situation. <clears throat> so what's Olam for those of you who might not know? Olam is a leading food and agribusiness. Um, it's listed in Singapore. Um, the market cap is about 5 billion US dollars. It trades about four to $5 million a day. Um, 
Now, quite recently, um, Olam won approval from the High Court to restructure the business. And they are actually, the, the entire group is going to split into three businesses and two of them will be separately listed over time. The first one is um, called Olam uh, OFI or Olam Food International. And this business is going to get listed uh, on the UK market as well as dual listed on Singapore. And over time, they will also spin off and list another business. So let's see what analysts have written on it on the platform. I'm gonna go back to all I'm here. Okay, so if we look at what Aaron George wrote recently, so first of all, Olam International will be replaced by the Olam Group as the listed entity as of 16th March, which is yesterday. The group will consist of OFI, which is Olam Food International, Olam Agri, as well as Olam International. It's all very confusing. And the reason this is happening is because, um, you know, Olam is now desperately trying to unlock some value. Um, for those of you who know the history, many years ago, Temasek came and backstopped the company at a time when there was a big short seller attack by Muddy Waters. So Temasek came and bought in about 51%. Mitsubishi Corp owns 14%. And now Olam is undergoing this restructuring into these three different entities. And, you know, they're really trying to unlock some shareholding value for these long suffering shareholders. So I'm not going to bore you with the full gory detail of this transaction, but suffice to see, say, both Arun as well as David Blanner has it. Uh, let's go back here. Uh, you know, they've, they've covered it, uh, this, the situation in great detail. They have presented sensitivity table here, for instance, on, you know, where Olam should trade based on how OFI lists. Um, long story short, we think there's 20 to 30 percent upside in Olam, but of course, a lot of this is contingent on, you know, how markets are trading and how the listing of OFI happens. Of late, there has been a lot of volatility in commodity markets. A lot of people have been caught out. Um, you know, if you look at base metal players like Glencore, their bonds are trading at very depressed valuations. So this is not a name without risk. Um, again, this is not a structural long-term idea. It is a situation, it's a very particular situation where there's 20 to 30% return potentially to be made. Um, it is not really for everyone. You know, many times, uh, a lot of the clients that we have on Smart Karma, they try to look for ideas that are multi-baggers over long periods of time, they're compounders. Olam at this juncture is probably not in that camp. Okay, secondly, as I mentioned, we're gonna look at a macro thematic. It's a fairly important one, which is, you know, what are some of the lessons that we can draw from the Ukraine crisis for Asia? And now one of our great political strategists and political analysts on the platform is Manu Bhaskaran. Manu is a partner and founder of Centennial Asia. He was uh, formerly, um, you know, with, the government of Singapore. He's also been uh, the chief economist for um, Kazana with Cosby Securities, Sokjen, very, very senior guy, very, very well followed. And, uh, and he tends to look at economies as well as political regimes around the world. So, you know, first things first, uh, clearly the world looks a lot more insecure. There is a market increase in global political risk. Um, what uh, is starting to happen is blocks are starting to form and Asian countries will be forced to align either with the West or with Russia as a result. Um, you know, military balance in North Asia is, you know, closely aligning with China. China has become even closer to Russia. Uh, you know, these are things that you've read uh, in newspapers over the last couple of weeks. Of course, short term, you know, for economies, this is negative news because this will result in broken supply chains and higher energy prices. That is not good news for a lot of emerging Asian countries that import refined product. Larger, slightly, you know, a larger consequence and a longer term consequence is that supply chains will definitely get reconfigured. 
it'll become harder to buy certain products directly from Russia. We might be buying them indirectly through another nation that acts as an intermediary. Secondly, we're going to see uh, accelerated defense spending. So we should definitely be looking at sectors and stocks that are exposed to higher defense spending. Uh, thirdly, we're going to see countries start to spend more time and attention on energy security, uh, as well as commodity security in general. So for instance, uh, just in the last week, we have seen South Korea elect a new leader, and this new leader is extremely pro-nuclear energy. So over the next few years, we should expect to see uh, South Korea really, really spend a capital on building uh, its, its nuclear supply chain. And there are several really interesting stocks that we have discussed in detail on the back of this as well. If you want to read that in detail, Douglas Kim is the analyst who's written about nuclear energy in Korea. Okay. Third, you know, whether there's war or no war, we are increasingly very positive on cyber security companies. Um, you know, whether it's governments or the corporate sector, or even us as individuals, we are increasingly vulnerable and we will be increasingly thinking about how to protect ourselves, how to immunize ourselves, how to buy insurance against cyber attacks, hacking, and so forth. So, you know, this is the core of the thesis. This particular war has categorically uh, resulted in huge emphasis being, being put on cybersecurity threats. Um, what we have started to see is capital flowing back into global cyber companies. So when, uh, when this particular insight was published, you know, 20 of the largest IT sector security stocks were up by about 5.5% versus the S&P, which was down 3%. And as you can see from the chart on the bottom, cybersecurity names have started to outperform relative to the S&P just as of this month, right? There are some clear winners in the US. There's Palo Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, Fortinet, Checkpoint, and so forth. There is also a very simple and useful ETF, which is called HACK, H-A-C-K, Space US, which you could use to uh, play this. And as you can see, you know, this ETF uh, doubled from its lows in March, then it peaked at about $67 and has come back, you know, about 20% before starting to bounce again. So this is probably a, one of those thematics that will stay expensive, but fairly structural for a period of time. Uh, and with that, I'm at the end of today's forum. In case you have any questions, now is the time to ask using the Q&A button. But if not, then please kindly continue to post discussions on the platform, and we will be sure to answer questions that way. Okay, since we've got no questions coming in, we're going to wrap it up for today. Thank you very much. That's it for this week. You can find more ideas like the ones we discussed today on demand on our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and hit the notification button. If you like these ideas, spread the word. Tell a fellow investor about Smart Karma Plus and follow us on social media. Just search for Smart Karma. And of course, don't forget to visit smartkarma.com for more independent, differentiated investment insights. Thanks for watching and see you next week.